Well, Happy New Year. As Father John said, we start the church calendar today, the first Sunday of Advent, in the first year of our three-year cycle of readings. So if you're prone to making resolutions, you could make this one. If you promise yourself to read every gospel, uh, starting with this Sunday and starting now for three years, you will have read the entire Sunday lectionary. And that would be a very good thing, perhaps life-changing. But my goodness, you would expect this first Sunday of Advent to be a happy one. The readings should be happy, the lovely anticipation of Christmas. And certainly Hallmark would have it be that way. But here in our gospel today, Matthew, we find Jesus in the middle of a few end-of-life passages that are we, preachers always find difficult. Uh, then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. With our Thanksgiving turkey barely digested, we're asked to think about how mortal we are, how vulnerable we are to this unknown date and time when we will meet our maker, as they say. The season of Advent reminds us that God promised Israel a Messiah, a Savior. And in Jesus, God comes in human flesh to deliver the people from sin and evil. On the other hand, it's also true that Advent calls us to anticipate the day on which Jesus returns as King of Kings. He will put all that resists him, even death itself, under his feet. And Jesus warns that this will take people by surprise. And the point is we should be ready at any time. And we'll talk a little bit about that today, our readiness. Now, there are a range of beliefs about end times, and a range of beliefs would be consistent with phrases in the Bible, and it's not explained really explicitly. And, and this is one of those issues that it depends on which passages one emphasizes. So personally, I have a hard time believing there will be one last judgment day such as depicted by Michelangelo in the fresco uh, out at the altar of the Sistine Chapel, the Last Judgment. Rather than taking that literally, I prefer to view today's passage as a message that God's radical claims are on us here and now. Each day is a day of judgment, so to speak, I ask myself, am I making good on my vows to work for God, God's kingdom? Am I living in the way of Christ? Have I allowed myself to be distracted by selfish cares? Am I alert to see where Christ arrives in my life, breaking through time and space to be present in my life and the life of others? How am I walking in God's light now? There is power in walking in God's light now. You may know that during the week, I work as a chaplain in a retirement community, and I'm housed largely in the assisted living building. So I spend a good part of my day with people in their 90s. And this passage speaks to them often because they are, they feel, closer to death. They often quote the phrase, not knowing the day nor the hour. But this not knowing is true for us all, isn't it? And since COVID and the wreckage of the pandemic on retirement communities, I've been doing some reading to try to come to better terms with what happened. And one writer, Kathleen Dowling Singh, she wrote a book called The Grace of Aging. She's really captured my attention. She encouraged us to open deeply to the truth of our own impermanence. She writes, many of us still cling childishly to so much that is unreal and inessential. 
Many of us still cling to reputation, to imagined security, to unexamined habits of attitude and behavior, and to self-image. And she encourages clear-eyed acceptance of the way things really are. She feels it's only by embracing this on a gut level that we can best use the time that we have. And we all have reservoirs of fear, some large and some small and subtle, around entering our last years. What will aging do to me, to my body, to my mind? Will I matter to anyone? Will I be a burden? And how will I die? We do not know. We have no clue what these years will hold. We have no clue what will happen tomorrow. The moment that changed everything usually arrives unannounced, like the plucking of the person from the field or the plucking of the woman from the hearth. But in our heart of hearts, we do know a few things. I often visited a man named Charlie. At 95, Charlie was a widower who came to assisted living after the death of his wife, who he loved dearly, still spoke of her. One day he was weeping softly and said to me, Chaplain, why am I still here? Why doesn't God take me? And this very poignantly and sadly, is a fairly common question that I get from the residents. It was his habit to tell long stories, and I enjoyed these immensely because it was another phase of life, another slice of life that I had never known. It was He grew up on a farm in Idaho in the early, you know, part of the, uh, the 20th century. He had rough winters, the lack of electricity. His father worked on a railroad, so his mom, he was basically raised by his mom and grandmom who made sure that he got to church every week. He also attended our church service every week. Eventually he met a girlfriend in our building. Yes, it happens. And everyone was so excited for this budding romance. But one day she fell and she declined rather quickly. And it was yet another loss for Charlie. We talked about the fact that even though he doesn't see his family a lot, he still is the ballast that holds them together. We talked about how he greets people each morning as he sits outside reading the newspaper on, on warm days. We talked about his deep bass singing in our church service that encourages others. There is power in walking in God's light now. I left. And I said that to him. Later that day, and with a big smile, he started bellowing out a song. And he, he said he learned it back in Sunday school in Idaho. Brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner where you are. Even from your humble hand the bread of life may feed. Brighten the corner where you are. I don't think it's one that we know, do we? That was an old oldie. The day after Charlie died, I was talking to his daughter, and I told her this story. She smiled, and she said, as she was driving home after his death, in front of her appeared this most magnificent sunset. It was all white and all silver, and she called it a triumph. And she said to me, he's definitely brightening the corner where he is now. As a chaplain, I'm mostly a listener, but I try to hold this one thought in my mind as I listen. How is this person living in God's light? To me, that one thought gives one purpose. I can't say this to them in so many words, but sometimes I get to be a mirror where I reflect that light back to them. We learn from today's passage that uncertainty is okay. It's not a sign of wavering faith. Rather, it's the nature of our existence. We can't know the day or the hour, but Jesus does call us to a life of work, activity, 
here and now in a spirit of wakefulness and watchfulness, as the hymn says. Do what you can in a spirit of hope and, tr and trust. Now, last week we did a little uh, quiz of, uh, in, in conjunction with tending our soil. We, we ranked a list of values in terms of what we think St. Anne's values are. And there was a list of about 15. And I was doing the little tallying, and there were two overwhelming, hands-down winners of that list of values. One was faith, and one was caring. Faith and caring, that's a catalytic combination. If it were just caring, you could be a social service agency, but there's faith with it. Faith and caring. It's really nice. And it's such a good omen for the 70 so people that are going to be moving next door to us to have neighbors like St. Anne's Church. We can shape ourselves now into people of greater wisdom and love and compassion, and it's never too early to start. We can learn, we can continue to learn and to seek spiritual maturity. And Catherine Singh writes, there is no more noble way to spend these years than to bear witness to the world as placeholders for peace, love, wisdom, and fearlessness. Fearlessness. So therefore, what is a theology of the coming kingdom that's most faithful? I think when it reminds us that the readiness to which Jesus calls us today is not shaped by fear of the future, but rather by gratitude for life that Jesus already offers us. We are transformed more and more into the stature of Christ. So jumping back to the first reading today in Isaiah, it may sound familiar because MLK used parts of it in his I Have a Dream speech, and it turns out it also appears in Micah. So there was obviously a source that both Isaiah and Micah used. And in fact, the anticipatory aspects of the Isaiah tradition are not unlike the I Have a Dream speech. And this tradition has an anticipation for the future rooted in God's resolve. So imagine we have the prophet Isaiah, and he walks onto a darkened stage in a circle of light, much the way Linus walks onto the stage in Charlie Brown's Christmas. And Isaiah begins to sing of a mountain and all nations streaming to it, willing to hear the holy instruction and willing to make peace. As the song is ending, he hears we hear the sound of hammers striking the metal. It's turning the swords and spears into plowshares and pruning hooks. So these are instruments for taking life, being changed into instruments for sustaining life. And this is an invitation to live towards that day. O house of Jacob, come walk in the light of the Lord. Even if it is hard to believe, there will be a day of new and longed-for reality. There is power in walking in God's light now. And we lit the first Advent candle as a foretaste of that light that is coming in Christ. I met a 90-something-year-old uh, man who spent most of his life making maps for the military. Amazing how many map makers there were. I have met a lot of map makers. It must have been before computers and everything. It's a very important occupation. He's also apparently a deep thinker and a Christian. He said, I'm an optimist. Despite global warming and economic problems and poli political calamities, he still believes that because of the internet and the great signs of cooperation and advances in our understanding of each other, on a grand scale, we are headed to what is called a second renaissance. Those are his words. 
I'm so grateful for this prophetic vision. It's refreshing and perhaps we should embrace it. We don't often hear those kind of optimistic visions. Isaiah's time too had its own di difficulties with the Assyrian Empire threatening both northern and southern Israel. God's reign will be established for all to see on Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord's house, the temple. All nations shall stream to it. It's not so much a political claim, but a spiritual one. There's geography, yes, but the mountain becomes a metaphor when we read about God's ways, God's past, God's instruction, God's word from Jerusalem. All express the direction that comes from God all counters the alternatives that come from our secular world that can be self-centered and based on greed. God is the true source of guidance, and we are reminded in Advent that God's word becomes incarnate in the baby Jesus. Isaiah's oracle gives us hope. O house of Jacob, Jacob come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Doesn't this invitation remind you of the hymn, Come, let us adore him. We need to be reminded of the light that is coming in Christ at Christmas. We reenact this process every Advent. We have the light of Christ already, but we reenact it so that we can contemplate it once again at each phase of our lives and mine it for new discoveries. So in Advent, we lift our sight beyond the challenges and crises of our time. We participate with the generation since Isaiah in the hope for a world transformed by peace. Amen.